Hello, and welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency, devoted to promoting musicians and authors worldwide. Call us today at 941 877 1552 to start your free publicity evaluation. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Please welcome the host of Interviewing the Legends, music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello once again, everyone. I'm your host, Ray Shasho. Welcome to another edition of Interviewing the Legends on BBS Radio. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or email us at publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. And by the Rockstar Chronicles Series 1, my new book. Featuring over 45 intimate conversations with the greatest music legends the world will ever know. Available now at bookbaby.com and amazon.com. Kenny Laguna has been in the music industry as a musician, songwriter, singer, and producer for nearly five decades. His resume is uh, as diverse as his talents, including bubblegum, punk, rock, indie rock, blue-eyed soul, and more. He has produced Darlene Love, Bill Medley, Edwin Starr. The Steve Gibbons Band, Bow Wow Wow, including the band's biggest hit, I Want Candy, the soundtrack to the Andy Warhol movie, Lonesome Cowboys, and he wrote and produced for Berserkly Records with Jonathan Richmond and Greg Kinn. Kenny Laguna is Joan Jett's longtime producer, songwriting partner, and partner in their label, Blackheart Records, along with his wife, high school sweetheart, Merle Laguna, and their daughter, Carrie Ann Brickman. He has produced many Blackheart artists, including Girl in a Coma, Cherie Curry, and The Vacancies. Starting at the tender age of 12 years old, Kenny was playing keyboards for New York Radio High School Hops for $20 a day when he was recognized by an industry bigwig. This led to other doors that Kenny kicked open, and eventually he found himself producing and playing in bubblegum bands like Tommy James and the Shondells, good friends of the station, the Archie, Shadows of Night, 1910 Fruit Gum Company, and the Ohio Express. By 1972, Kenny had played and sung on over 50 Billboard Top 40 hits. After the demise of Bubblegum, he was given the opportunity to produce for the Who's label in London, which would prime him for the next phase, punk rock. Kenny was asked to help and produce six songs in eight days with a young singer named Joan Jett. Her former band, The Runaways, had broken up, but they were still con contracted to do a project that was yet unfinished. Kenny and Joan immediately found they were kindred spirits and have collaborated on every Joan Jett album and hit ever since. In 2015, Kenny, alongside Jett, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He felt honored to be standing next to his best friend, accepting the COVID award. After 35 years of creating music together, he and Jett are still touring the world, writing and recording new music. Please welcome legendary American songwriter and record producer, best known for his work with Joan Jett, Kenny Lagunda, to Interviewing Legends. Hello, Kenny. Hello. That's a great intro. I, really, I want to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I really wanted you on the show. First of all, I, you know, I, lo I love Joan. We have a lot in common. I was born in, I was raised in Maryland. I actually did the Orioles Fantasy Camp one year before she did, 1990. And I always, wow. yeah, I always wanted to talk to her about that. I'm a big Oreo fan as well. But, uh, you know, I was a top 40 DJ back in the late 70s. And any guy that had been in, evol involved with so many big hits, especially from top 40 radio, is, is my hero. <laughs> and that'd be you. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Yeah, hits, hits are a miracle. Everyone is they're a miracle. You, you were uh, Tommy. Tommy James. I, I had Tommy on the show many, many times. He's a he's a great guy, and 
We talked about the old uh, Morris Levy thing, and I'm sure you did. You know Morris? I know him really well. Yeah, and he was integral, right, in the success of Black Art Records. Really, I didn't know that. Yep, when it was, you know, we we had various royalty streams that he didn't respect, but he. He really came through for John and I when we were struggling, and he was he was great. I mean, I, I had nothing to say. Uh, you know, he told us what the deal was in the beginning, right? And and uh, obviously Tommy shared the pie that Mars helped himself to was a lot bigger than mine. But you know, to tell you the truth, he said the, his records got to number eleven before we even knew if they were good, and. You know, that was a great start of a mm -hmm. career. Yeah, Tommy says that if it wasn't for Morris Levy, there wouldn't have been a Tommy James. So, Well, I'm glad Tommy feels that way. Yeah. That's how I feel about the stuff we did. But when Jones Turn was there, you know, at the Strawberries, he always gave great reports on our records. And, you know, and he, he once made phone calls for, for Joan and me so that I was set up to be promotion men, independent promotion men, and so I was a guy, you know, it was, it was like a record business. I was a made man, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I owe that to Morris. You know, if he said this guy could be trusted, that's huge. Yeah. I, you know, I think Morris knew what a hit was, you know. He could listen to it and say, that's a hit. You know, that's that's kind of a gift, I think. Well, he, he doesn't give it enough credit. He, he may not have started it, but he was the guy behind Kintel. Right. Television advertising, which Time Life must make a billion dollars on. Yeah. Uh, he invented that, or, you know, he was the guy. Mm -hmm. Sugar Hill. Yeah. That was the first rap label, Morris. Birdland, mm -hmm. Jazz Club, Morris. Right? Strawberry. He invented that. Yeah. And then right. after that was all those other ones that came later, Peaches and Coconuts and everything. It was all a copy of what Morris had mm -hmm. done. He was a record man to the 10th degree. I mean, you know. And, and to tell you the truth, if you knew how to negotiate, I mean, anybody talks bad about Morris, I take issue with. Mm -hmm. Right. He, he, you know, he was a he was a gentleman, and, and he had honor. You had to understand how the street honor works. And you know, I, I had no problem still with Morris Davis. I thought he was the greatest. Well, I I have an uncle that had a store on Broadway, and he was. Uh a little connected, should I say? So I kind of grew up with that kind of stuff. <laughs> so oh, I can imagine. <laughs> I understand it. <laughs> yeah, you kind of had to be connected to stay in business. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. My dad had businesses since uh, I was little. You know, we had retail electronic stores and, and had, like gift shops in D.C. for years and years. And we dealt with New York all the time, and yeah, it's you know that's just like you said, that's the the way you did business. That's all, you know. Well, I found it to be very uh, it was a more gratifying situation. Like now, I'm dealing with the, the big companies, and they even bought the records that were part of these old mafia labels. Right. And you know, I you know, like I just realized the other day, somebody sent me some stuff about the lemon pipers, and I wrote. Uh, one of the songs in the Lemon Pipers and Green Tambourine, I noticed it's, it's on at least three albums that are active today. Mm -hmm. And even though it's almost no money, I don't get statements. Right. And I, you know, I call, uh, we have an in-house, and say, you know, let's go look at that. I, I, I wrote the same here to the uh, uh, Yummy album. It's not a lot, but it's in print. They don't send statements, you know. Right. So why are they different than Sonny Fancheesi? You ever hear of him? Yes. Yep. I, you know, I, I didn't know him well, but he owned the label I was started my career on. Yeah. Uh, I love these guys. Yeah. You know, they, they, they were straight talkers, you know. They, they, they told me they weren't going to pay me, and they told me to 
<laughs> you know, I, I had, uh, I, I'm probably the only guy that hunted down Ivan Brown from the Lemon Pipers. I had him on the show. <laughs> he, he, he was so happy well, to be on the show, yeah. Was that the least thing? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, Cole Lecter made those records, and but I wasn't aware of the band playing anything on that Green Tambourine album. Mm-hmm. I played on it. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's still trying to make a living. You know, him and his wife uh, do music together, and he sent me a bunch of samples and things like that. You know, and ni- nice guy, really nice guy. And and a hell of a singer. Yeah, good singer, very good singer. But the, my, my song was Rainbow Tree, and I played yeah. the chord on that album. I know Rainbow oh. Tree. We talked about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice. sure did. I imagine the band must have been freaking out at some point. I don't know. How is he feeling? Is he bitter about the uh, fact that they, you know, and he, he got, I never looked at them as a bubblegum band. I, I was <laughs> reading, I was just reading it up because somebody sent me a newspaper article about the Lemon Pipe this mm-hmm. when they had a hit. And, you know, they were grouped as psychedelic bubblegum, but they were totally different camp. I happen to straddle both camps, but they weren't Kazan's cats. They weren't bubblegum. They were, uh, I always thought they were... Psychedelic. Yeah. Kind of psychedelic, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess, you know, they might have resented it. You know, they they were more real. Like, you know, I was spread. They were nice fellows, too. But, right. You know, Joey Levine, the, those two hits, and... Jeff and Jerry went to Ohio, and the first junior high school they went to, they saw a band playing, and they said, you want to be in the Ohio Express? So, boom, that was it. Yep. A little different than the Lemon Fighters, which, you know, they were the Lemon Fighters, yep. I think. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think sometimes the, uh, the people get ruined. And, and, you know, in a way, my part of it, maybe I feel guilty sometimes, but I put together the, the band that did Beatle, Beatlemania. Mm-hmm. And those poor guys, the four that started it, you know, it, it's the guy who played Paul McCartney, Mitch Weissman, he was a talented guy, but then he became this thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know if it kind of set his whole life in a funny place. You know, he was like a star. Right. But he was a star playing Paul McCartney in a Broadway show. Right. So, you know, he had to acclimate his head, you know, mm-hmm. and reconcile all that. You know what I mean? And so it's the same thing with these bubblegum bands. They had hit records, and you know, I'll trust they didn't even hear them until they were on the radio. <clears throat> I love the bubblegum bands, man. I, I love everything from the '60s that was on the radio. That was a great. That was the greatest period in music was the '60s. You know, especially for radio. Oh yeah, but you, you know, I'm just saying about the, where was the integrity? And, you know, like we were making the records, but we didn't want to go out on the road, right? Because we thought we were cooler than that. Yeah. But, who knows, you know, we, we didn't get a lot of respect in America. When I went to England, the bubblegum thing was, I got a little more respect. Mm-hmm. And then when punk happened, everything turned around. The punks hated Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Right, punk. right. And they liked Yummy Yummy, which was like, I thought it was a bizarre <laughs> world because I took so much shit <laughs> for making bubblegum music, you know, yeah. in America. I I heard that uh, the monkeys were supposed to play Sugar Sugar, but then the Archies got it because the monkeys turned it down. Did you know? Did you hear that? No, I didn't even know the monkeys were allowed to turn things down. Yeah, well, yeah, they got, you know... They, did, they got a little too big for their britches with Don Kirshner, which I thought Kirshner was, you know, a genius. You know, I mean, he helped he helped the Monkees, he helped Kansas, he made Kansas a, a great band. 
But they got, uh, you know, they wanted to write their own music, and that's when they wrote Head, that album Head, but they turned down a lot of other projects, which, you know, could have made them a lot of money. Well, it, it, it's funny how things are. I mean, the Monkees proved that they had more going on than people thought because the Mike Nesney short had an incredible song for one of the runs. That, right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people get typecast. But the truth is, they were characters in a television show. Yeah. And they weren't Ricky Nelson either. Yeah, you know, sp- but, um, speaking of Ricky Nelson, guess who I talked to before I called you? <laughs> tell me. Ma- Matthew Nelson. You know, from the Nelsons. Uh, yes, R- I, I, I've met those guys. Yeah. Cool. Ricky Nelson's son. We talked about Ricky and Ozzy and, and everybody. Nice guy. Really nice guy. Really nice people. I love them, yeah. Yeah. You, did, was it your idea to do Crimson and Clover for Joan? Well, the way that was, she was she pulled the album out of my vinyl back in 1980. Right. And she went, oh, I love this song, mm-hmm. you know. mention uh, something Joan did recently. I just had Mark Urselli on the show. Uh, he engineered the, the latest Angel-Headed Hipster project that was right. created by Hal Wilner. And um, Joan was awesome on that track. She, she sang uh, Jeepster on the, right. on the album. It was She did a great job. That's probably my favorite song on the album. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, she got, you know, and, and her guitar players on there too. And uh, I think, you know, she and Al are along great. And obviously, we work with, with your guy there. Mm-hmm. And first said that Al got sick. Yeah, I know. From COVID, right? I think he got, yeah. Yep. yep. It's horrible. That's horrible. Kenny, you're you're the real deal, man. You're, there there isn't many guys like you left in the industry, you know. And uh, I I just thank you for everything you've done. I just wish you could do more. 
Well, maybe we will. Yeah. Uh, what, what about, uh, is there any plans for an, uh, a new album from Joan? Yeah, always. Yeah? You know, we're, we're, we're just setting up now that, you know, SIR closed. Right. That was, that was, we had the best locker in New York, which is great. You know, like when we started, we used to look at these super bands that had these, and then we eventually had the best locker. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We sold the building. Really? So we're setting up we're setting up a rehearsal studio in my house. And then we're you know, John's still writing with mm-hmm. you know, we all try it and our guitar player Doug Needles writes really good. We're definitely gonna make more records and it, we've been lucky. We have various projects. Rebel Girls is a is a book mm-hmm. about it's not a lot of musicians. The first book has one musician, it's Joan. But there are people like the, the, the scientist Curry and, and uh, famous writers and just women who were groundbreakers and, and they, they made an album and Joan contributed to that. Right. And, the, and then there was an old time thing that CAA put together to raise money for old timers. Contributed to that, and then we have this one we did with Hal Wilner. That that's great. She mm-hmm. just did a duet with Miley Cyrus, which is yeah. I mean, Miley is a good friend, and she's massive. I mean, she just announced that she did it, and John was trending like top ten. <laughs> um, so you know, we're doing we're doing a lot of stuff. Good, good. Uh, and I love the movie Bad Reputation. I saw the movie; it was great. I, I really enjoyed oh. it. Yeah, it's excellent. Barry Ann produced that. Yeah. I, I've, I've had uh, Lita, Lita on the show several times, and Cherie, and I'm friends with Susie Quattro, who I know Joan and Joan likes a lot. Um, yes, we're in touch with Susie. Yeah, she's, she's good, you know. I, I, I love what she does on the side, man, that wood carving thing. That's incredible with the, with the saw, the uh, electric saw. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. She had a terrible accident a couple of years ago. Terrible. Really, I didn't know that. She, yeah, she yeah she fell like thirty feet. Holy crap! Oh. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, she's good. Yeah. What What do you think? What do you think of Kim Fowley? I it, didn't. She, Cherie, I think, took care of Kim at, in his final days, didn't she? Well, for for a week or two. Yeah. I think, I think it didn't end well. You know, he had a girlfriend and everything, but... Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, Kim, we, we like Kim a lot, Johnny and me. Mm-hmm. We go along great right with him. I, I, I thought he was a character. He, he was way out, you know. Yeah. Way, way out. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. I don't know how Kim and Cherie got together because they spent decades quarreling. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm glad they reconciled. That's good, yeah. Yeah, she told me she did. Yeah. She told me when she had him over her house and kind of taking care of him and everything. But, you know, uh, The Runaways was such a soap opera. The movie, The Runaway, mm-hmm. which, you know, I was, John and I were executive producers. Uh, I kind of lost control of it because you do when you deal with the Hollywood guys, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but, but my initial idea was to do like Cold Case and have this drama because, you know, they all fight. They fight with me. They fight, I guess they fight with everybody but Joan. But, um, you know, the, the, the thing with Kim and the girls and how they blame him for this and that and the other thing. Right. You know, while, while they're blaming him, they should give him credit too because he was a, you know, Barnum and Denui type guy, you know. It, 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 but that's what the movie I wanted to make is how that year and a half of high school age, which is when the five of them went together, they were together three and a half years from the five of them were together, you know, how it affected their whole lives. Mm-hmm. It, it's still like a thing over their lives that they never shook. How, how much of that you think was true? What they said uh, about all that? What, the scandal? Yeah, the scandal. Not true. Really? Not true. No way. 
Yeah. Not true. And, um, you know, they said wait until he was dead. Yeah. Well, I know two people, definitely, Lita and, and, uh, and Joan, I don't think they take crap from anybody. <laughs> That's right, you know, and, it, you know, it, 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 it's just bullshit. And, you know, to get a, you, you, it, there's no defending against that shit. Yeah. The more you defend, the more you dig a hole. Right, right. So, you know, you just, um, there's a long history of bullshit and trying to get into the spotlight. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, picture being the girls who turned down out of rock and roll. Right. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of things people don't know about you. You kind of uh, restarted, I, I guess, Darlene Love's career when she was having a hard time. Uh, yes, it's, that's true. Yeah. It was a she was cleaning the houses in Beverly Hills. Wow. And uh, then she wrote a, did she write a book or something? And I don't think she... Much later. Yeah, she wrote the book much later. Yeah. I, I took her back to New York, and then she got into the um, Broadway show, mm -hmm. Leader of the Pack. And, you know, it was a great thing when it was in the, the bottom line. And when the Broadway people took over, it's like the story of getting involved with these Broadway and movie people, you know, they always know better. But yeah. the thing that was going on at the bottom line was unbelievable. Paul Shaker played Phil Spector. Yeah. She's and she's she's still around doing shows, I think, isn't she? Yeah, well, yeah. apart from COVID, yeah, yeah, she's around and she owns Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's right. She had the big Christmas hits. Yeah, more than one. Yeah, okay, Christmas Day, please come home. But you know, uh, Winter Wonderland, she did. Uh, yeah, between her and Ronnie. Mm -hmm. When it comes to rock and roll, Christmas. Yeah. yeah, that's true. The other thing was you you were roommates with Sissy Spacek, right? That is true. <laughs> N nobody would think that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something? That is something. That blew me away. <laughs> she was a uh, a cut, she was a pop star. That? What's that? Where did you find that information? Oh, I I dig deep. <laughs> <laughs> but she was a country uh, she was a singer right at, at that time yes yes and she had a record that had a little bit of success in reaction to John Lennon and Yoko's uh, Two Virgins uh huh right it was John you've gone too far this time so huh yeah so you know I was trying to help her with her singing career and then when she she decided to take acting lessons I walked into the first lesson I believe I paid for that lesson wow and you know nobody took it that seriously and the next thing I know she's got a part in a movie with Lee Marvin she's on cut and yeah it's, uh, an amazing movie and for me I'm an animal activist and a vegan and yeah that movie I, I love that movie yeah and then you know Sissy was her, she you know when she became a superstar Instead of becoming part of the Hollywood scene, yeah, I, I love her. She's she's a great actress. She's great. But yeah. she didn't become part of that Hollywood scene. She moved to Charlottesville, Virginia, mm -hmm. and raised her family so they would not be good for her. Hollywood brats, and, and good for her. You know, she she remains pretty down to earth. Not pretty, but down to earth. Yeah. I mean, I. I don't know her like I used to, but we, 
somehow touch base every few years. Mm-hmm. Another guy that was involved too was Bobby Bloom, the the guy who sang Montego Bay, right? Yeah. Yeah. Bobby. Yeah, he was he was another roommate. Mm-hmm. How yeah, about that? Bobby was very talented, and but he was crazy, and he had a screw loose when it came to women. <laughs> you, you know, well, he, he used to beat women. Oh, he went out with, and he went out with a gangster's daughter. So, oh, that's not good. That's all you need to know. You know, he shot with his own gun. Mm-hmm. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, you don't have to be Confucius to know. Don't beat up a gangster's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I, I want to say some things. Of the Joan Jett's band, it's still the same band, right? It's awesome. I love, I love the, and of course, you're great in the band as well. I, I, I actually covered you guys a while back at uh, Bush Gardens in Tampa, and I got some fantastic pictures of Joan. I was right up there. Oh. Yep. Send them along if you have a good chance. I, I'll send them to you if you want. They're, I mean, they're like I'm on stage with her. They're fantastic photos. But actually, they put me on uh, Joan's site when I did the review. Oh, uh-huh. yeah. Cool. But uh, you know what I love about Joan? She she's got the personality on stage. I, I love when she's you know she smirks and smiles and stares at the audience. You know that's that's really something the, the way she plays with the audience. You know. You know she's a very you know she has the gift. She has the uh, gift. Yes, she does. She's incredible. She really is. Well, one one of these days, I'd like to interview Joan and talk about uh, Dream Week and the Orioles because I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she 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 she, she tore a rotator cuff trying to. Uh, I don't know it was one of your great uh, Oriole uh, knuckleballers. You would know who it is. One of those four great guys in 1969. You know, was there teaching her, and she just tried a little too hard. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Stay in touch with Julie. We'll get to it. Okay. Yeah, she's she's a lefty, right? I think she pitched during fantasy camp. Yeah, but she she bats right. Right. I hear she was a pretty good hitter too. Yeah, she she was always the best in the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it was embarrassing, and I was always the worst. <laughs> Kenny, here's a question I ask everybody, and I get some very interesting answers. Okay. If you if you had a feel the dreams wish like the movie to perform collaborate with anyone from the past or present who would that be? Dean Martin. Dean Martin, really? Yeah. Cool. Have you met him? No. 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 <clears throat> After that, Elvis. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I, I talked to, I interviewed uh, Petula Clark, and she had a thing for Dean Martin. She said he's he's the nicest man, and a lot of people didn't take him serious because they thought he was drunk, you know, when he did interviews and things like that. But, you know, just such a nice guy who never rehearsed. <laughs> well, he was also a very smart guy. People don't realize he, he, he was a brilliant businessman. He mm-hmm. was the biggest stockholder of the individual people in RCA and DC. And, yeah, I mean, but I just love his style. And, yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. I was a big Frank Sinatra fan, too. I, I saw, oh, me too. I saw him five times in concert. Oh, me too. Sinatra was God in my family. Me, me oh. too. Me too. Yeah. And, oh, he endorsed Ronald Reagan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, you know, they were friends in the movie business, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I get all that. Yeah. yeah. But it, it's why we try to keep, keep a low profile with, uh, you know, the politics as best we can, you know, because uh, <clears throat> I, I just saw my parents really get the thing. They were going to school as communists, for Christ's sake. So, <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> you know they, they, they were not really, you know, they thought the Kennedys were too right wing. So, right, right. Um, um, but you know, I you know, I learned that much. You, you know, you can really piss people off with your politics. I'm, I'm glad you said that because w- why alienate half your audience? <laughs> you know, right? Why? 
right. why, it doesn't make sense. Johnny Carson always said that. He says, I don't want to tell people my political views. Why should I alienate half my audience, you know? Why piss right. people off? Keep it to yourself, you know? I mean, if you want to donate, fine. But, you know, today they're just coming out attacking people, which I don't get, you know? I mean, I don't care who you're for. You, you know, you shouldn't attack anybody. You know, just uh, play your music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can you have anything else you'd like to add? Anything else to promote? No, I'm pretty good. Yeah? I, I yeah. just I just want to tell you I'm a big admirer of yours. Uh, you know, everything you did for Joan, when the chips were down, you guys pulled it together, selling records out of the back of your car, which is amazing. That's something I would probably never do. But you guys did it. You got perseverance, and you got the job done. And you guys are uh, you guys you guys are huge. You know, rock and roll hall of fame. So keep doing what you're doing, man. Well, thank you so much for you taking the time with me, and uh, um, we'll see sometime you do it with John. So that'll be great, Kenny. I, I, I'm going to send you a copy of my book. It's uh, I did 45 interviews with. Uh, you won't believe the list of people I chatted with, and like twelve of them have passed away already, unfortunately. But uh, right. do you want do you want the book or do you want the uh, the ebook? Can I get both? Yeah, I'll send you both. How's that? That'd be great. Fantastic. Okay. All Thank right, Kenny. Safe. Thank you so much, man. Take care. All right, stay safe out there. Thank you. All right. Bye bye now. For more information about Kenny Laguna and Joan Jett, visit www.lagunatunes.com. Kenny Laguna Discography at www.kennylaguna.com backslash discography. www.blackheart.com for Blackheart Records. www.joanjett.com, Joan Jett official website. Very special thanks to Julie Radar with Blackheart Records for arranging this interview with Kenny Laguna and the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the music happen for each and every broadcast of Interviewing the Legends. If you have comments or suggestions for the show, please contact me at interviewingthelegends at gmail.com and please subscribe to my YouTube channel Interviewing the Legends with Ray Shasho for the very latest interviews. Hey, it's real news, people. And of course, my new book, is finally out, entitled The Rockstar Chronicles, Series 1. Chronicles truths, confessions, and wisdom from the music legends that set us all free. Order yours today on hardcover ebook at bookbaby.com. It features over 45 intimate conversations with some of the greatest legends the world will ever know. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. God bless and be safe out there. Bye-bye now. Thank you, everybody, for listening to Interviewing the Legends. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Tune in to Interviewing the Legends. Every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Pacific Time on BBS Radio, Station One.